Welcome to Hockey Night in New York, where Islanders hockey always reigns supreme. Whether you were raised at the barn in Uniondale or born in the stable at Belmont, Hockey Night in New York is your home for all things Isles. Now, let's drop the puck and get this party started. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Hockey Night in New York. Welcome to the program, everyone. It is Sunday, April 28th, 2024. Coming to you live from Florida Media in Rockville Center. Got another big show coming up for you tonight. Staying alive here at Hockey Night in New York because the New York Islanders are staying alive. Sean Rourke of NHL.com will be joining us. Looking forward to talking to him about Isles Canes. With me, as always, is Mr. Stefan Rosner. Stefan, how are you? I'm doing great. I don't know if the camera can pick it up, but I have the uh, playoff beard coming in. I feel like I'm 14 <laughs> years old again. Oh, yeah. It's, it's well on its jokes, way. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Very um, nice. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Hey, listen. Has the heart the heart rate is down to where it should it, be? It has it has gone down, yes, since yesterday afternoon. But let me tell you, that first overtime in particular, I was just uh, not in a good place. <laughs> not in a good place, but we survived. The Islanders win. We're going to dive fully into it. But before we do, I want to remind you all that we are proud to be presented by Blue Line Deli and Bagel. Satisfy your hunger at 719 West Jericho Turnpike in Huntington and 217 Carlton Avenue in East Islip, check out the menu at bluelinedeli.com. Also proud to be sponsored by Main Street Board Game Cafe. Find your crowd and unplug your game at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. And also happy to be sponsored by Razor and Kniff, attorneys of law ready to fight for you. Check them out at razorandkniff.com. That's R-A-I-S-E-R-A-N-D-K-E-N-N-I-F-F.com. For a free consultation, and if you're hanging out with us live in the chat and you want to get your questions in for Questions Brewing, just say Questions Brewing. Type in your question, and we will be happy to answer it later. So with that out of the way, Stefan so Rosner. I'm so proud of you. Yeah, had a little struggle with that last week. I'm so that proud was, of you. That was rough. But uh, here we are, three games to one. New York Islanders, Carolina Hurricanes. The Islanders still have a pulse, and we're going to find out if that pulse will continue beyond Tuesday. But why don't we just talk about how this series has, went, has gone. We can touch a little bit on the games that preceded yesterday and just everything that's been going on in the New York Islanders in the series. Yeah, I think you look at the most heartbreaking of the three losses is not the 3 nothing three uh, goal lead. It's not. That's not the heartbreaking loss. And I'll back up what Was said about it is they outplayed them in game one. Mm-hmm. That's the heartbreaking mm-hmm. loss because that's a game you thought you steal that game, you get off on a 1-0 in the series. The game two was a bad loss, but not heartbreaking because in theory, they did not deserve to win that game at all. No. They did no, get they a 3 nothing lead, and you have to close it out. But the heartbreaking right. loss is Monday because that was the game they, they should have won. In theory, again, they should have won the game too, but when you sit back and allow them, you, you got everyone knew that was coming. You didn't know what time in the game it was going to come, but you knew, okay, once they're shelled up, they're yeah. giving the, the Hurricanes... Mm-hmm. Every single chance. When we get to game two, I'll, I'll highlight exactly where I knew the, the beginning of the end <laughs> started. But we'll we'll blaze through the games real quick, and, and we'll cover on more recent history. But game one, Saturday at Carolina, 3-1 to one loss with the empty netter. Lee takes that early penalty, which was questionable. Uh, a little bit of an embellishment there from the Hurricanes really? as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think so. Embellishing? Yeah, I think so. I think that was the theme of game one, actually. I think, think you saw it a couple of times. You remember the Palmieri Slash, which the was a slash. attack of the Achilles. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good to see his legs are still okay. But, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I understand that, uh, you know, you, you go for whatever edge you can, but it, that's a little too far for me. Like, just earn the penalties, uh, the power plays that you get. You know what I mean? And that was too much. I mean, credit to him. It worked out, right? They end up getting that goal to, to start that game off. And, and you know, the Islanders are playing on their on their heels for pretty much the rest of the game. But, you know, they get the uh, the dirty goal from McLean in front. Uh, hard work there. I think M- McLean has been outstanding this He's entire series. Probably outside of Andersley. We'll get to him in a second. McLean's been their best player in these playoffs. He's been- Every game, whether he's fighting, right. whether he's crashing the net, whether he's just hitting, everything he's doing to spark and provide energy, he has been a... Definition of a playoff performer. Yeah, and I don't think any of us saw this coming. And and he's a guy who can really take over for that fourth line C. You know, if and when Casey is ready to relinquish it full time. Obviously, right now he's yeah. not playing in that position. But we'll see how long that lasts. But he's been great. Uh, you have a scoreless second period. Then you have the uh, Nason goal. Uh, bounces off Pollock, drops right to him, puts it in the net. Little little bad luck there. And uh, then, of course, uh, Nietzsche with the empty netter at the end of the game. But this is, like you said, this is a game where the Islanders outplayed the Canes. They probably deserved a better fate. But I think you have to give credit to Freddie Anderson just 
for the way he's been playing for the majority of this series. He's been absolutely outstanding. And they had a rough time getting pucks by him, but I think Wah kind of hit the hit the nail on the head at the end of the game saying, hey, look, we lost the game, but I'm feeling pretty good about it. I'm feeling encouraged. And then came game two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not very encouraging. Not very encouraging. Narrator voice, yeah. Yeah, so they go out to the early three-goal lead. Everybody's feeling pretty good. And for me, as soon as Varlamov yep. chose to take that tripping penalty yep. I said this is the beginning of the end right here this is where the, the game is going to turn because look you have the worst penalty kill all season long worst Canes have an outstanding power play Second sure best. you have a three goal lead but you also know what you've done with leads all season long don't give these guys a reason a foot in the door to get back into this game now granted the rest of the game was was just awful from an Islander standpoint anyway yeah, they got one shot they, they did get one. They, but but you look at this penalty, and mm -hmm. they score the power play goal to, to make it 3-1, to one, and then they completely take over momentum. They take over the game, and it was an, an inevitability. And, and who knows? Listen, I, we're, we can't rewrite history here, but if Varlamov doesn't take that penalty, maybe the game goes a little differently. Yeah. Maybe they don't get that third goal because that power play never happens. Maybe the momentum shift doesn't change, or maybe it doesn't come until later on. You just don't know, but... You know, listen, I have plenty to say about Varlamov later in the show, which is positive things, but that was the one thing I think he's done this series where I was like, man, I wish he just had a thought better on that play. Yeah, when you take a penalty as a goalie, the automatic thing is, well, was it earned or not? Because obviously they're, like, for, for me, for that, and I'm probably mm -hmm. a little biased, yeah. that's a play where you hack at the angles and stuff a lot. Now, maybe it was a little too far out of the crease and the refs are clearly watching things, mm -hmm. but then your goal is, all right, well, I have to now step up and kill this penalty because it's on me. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't happen like you said. If they right. don't take that penalty, maybe they get another goal. You never know, that. yeah. And I'll go against you, because this is what we love to do here. But sure, sure. I don't think Anderson's been outstanding in the sense that he's been an elite goalie in this series. But in those big moments, like Darcy Kemper for the Avalanche, he's, in the big moments, he's, he's made, made the saves he's saves. had to make and more. Yes. Um, yes. But I think, I mean, you've seen some... Uh, game one, he was shaky. Mm -hmm. Game two um, was a little... Sh game three, and we'll get to that in a second, he wasn't as bad as Sorokin was in that game, but he wasn't great. And that one either. Um, but again, big t that's stopping Dobson on that off the post shot, him diving with the glove, Romanov in the stack the pads formation, gloving that one. Yep. So he's made the mm -hmm. big saves yes. for sure. Yes. But I, I think if you look at goal, I think Varley has outplayed him in this series. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I think there's only one goalie that Anderson has outplayed so far in this <laughs> series, and, and we'll get to that eventually. But, you know, listen, that's a game that the Islanders could have won if things yep. went a little bit differently. Uh, obviously, you have the absolute disaster at the end of the game where not only do they finally tie it, everybody was just waiting for it to happen, but they kind of fell asleep after that. Nine seconds. And yes. They Some fell. may say that's a long time. <laughs> Some may, but my God, it, it fell quick that night. But, but you know, you have a kind of a soft play by Dobson there. It just yeah. kind of, I kind of feel like they were still a little shell-shocked yeah. from the tying goal. And Carolina just comes right in. To, I mean, it's inexcusable, but they come in, take that puck, and, and they don't even give the Islanders a chance at overtime because everybody's like, all right, it's going to overtime. We probably know how it's going to end just because of where the momentum is and how much Carolina was dominating. But at least if they get to the intermission, they can reset, and you never know what might happen. But again, they kind of fall asleep at the wheel there after the tying goal, and they go down 4-3, to three and we know what happened next. And I was confused, actually, where Var Varley was going on that. Um, it's one mm -hmm. thing if the player is coming around with momentum where they have to go yeah. to what would have been his blocker. So I was confused on why he automatically guessed that. Way. It's a read that he makes. It obviously didn't work out. And again, those are the goals that... Like, if you're going to lose a game, you want to get sniped. Like, in overtime yesterday, all I could think about was, if Varlamov is going to have a goal, let it be a goal that's earned, not the, the sure. goal that went in on Sorokin in Game 6 last year, or the one off his right. helmet, or that right. goal that they lose that. That's never the way you want those games. You tend. Obviously, you don't ever want to lose, but it's tough to see one go off your skate where you make the wrong read to try to get back. It's unfortunate. Yeah, brutal. And it's one thing to happen in Game 47 of the regular season, but you can't have that stuff happen in Game 2 of the NHL playoffs. So that yeah. was obviously a very, very tough pill to swallow. And I think moving now to game three comes home to UBS Arena. This is my personal opinion. I don't see any other reason behind it, but Patrick Waugh makes the decision to put Ilya Sorokin in, and I think for nothing else to just change the mind space of the players. Obviously, Varlamov was not at fault Correct. for those two losses in those first two games. I thought he played excellent, and I think this was just a decision that Wa made to say, hey, look, guys, let's let's get our heads back on our shoulders here. Let's Let's come out and win a game three. 
And I would have preferred he went with the safer play. I wasn't shy, shy about that on Twitter. And But look, it, it's a coin flip situation because at the same time, you want to make sure your your main starting goalie gets back into shape at yeah. some point, right? And and it just wasn't meant to be. Sorokin has a tough game, and, I, and I'll still say it, that uh, I think if Varlamov starts that game, it ends differently. Oh, well, Varley yeah. comes into that game after Sorokin allows mm-hmm. three goals and 14 shots, and mm-hmm. Varlamov stops all eight that he faces. And... The honors weren't even playing bad. Their gap control has been a big issue this mm-hmm. year in general and even in this series. But look at the goals that Sorokin allows. The screen one, just got to get better positioning. The Ajo goal that gets him pulled, that can never go in. Yes, I get Clutterbucks there, but mm-hmm. I did a breakdown, I think, in one of the articles about uh, snap, shot by shot, and he's just off his angle on every goal. The Orlov one, the pump fake, it's nice, but Sorokin is looking over the left shoulder. If it, What I was always taught, and again, not an NHL guy, but whatever <laughs> right. hand the guy shoots with, that's the side you have to cheat to. Because mm-hmm. if he's going against the grain, you're probably going to have that covered. You can't get beat short side. Right. So it's really tough. And if Varley's in there, that's been his biggest thing, his positioning. And you think yeah. it goes... The other way, he goes with the Ferrari instead of the Cadillac, which is what he said pregame. <laughs> right, right. And for me, as much as you could blame Wah for the move, Wah's trusting that his guy that has been a guy in moments that has come through big time, he's putting the trust in Sorokin, and, and Sorokin failed Wah in that situation. I think, yes, I think Wah had a good enough reason to yeah. make the call. Like, I'm not sitting here saying Wah's a moron, he's an idiot, he never should have made that move. I just prefer that he didn't. Yeah. But I get I get why he did it, and unfortunately it backfired. And, and he owned it. He was like, all right, Farley, get in there. He and, saw what happened out there, and, and he should have stopped at least two of those three, three goals, especially in a playoff game, especially knowing what Ilya Sorokin's capable of, right? When he's not in this funk that he's been in all season long, essentially, he's making those saves no problem, and for whatever reason, he just didn't have them. Yeah, and it's mental. That's all mental. That's yeah. not physical. And every, even Elliot Friedman was saying, you know, this is this guy didn't just forget how to play goalie. So it's right. all confidence. If that was his last performance of the year, mm. um, it'll be a long summer again like it was last year for him. And you have to just hope, and we'll, we'll talk about it later, but you have to hope that while in the organization finds a way to get Sorokin right because they're going to need him. Yes, no question about it. Now, of course, moving on to yesterday afternoon, the New York Islanders stave off elimination. Takes a little extra time to get there, but they get the double overtime win. Matt Barzell shows up in a big way. Two goals, obviously the big overtime winner. And this is another game where I feel like the Islanders played well. I feel like this hasn't been a David and Goliath type of series. Now, obviously, you can make your arguments about game two after the Canes took over. But I think this has been a close series throughout. And the Islanders played well. Uh, A little unfortunate that, once again, they couldn't hang on to a late lead, and they end up giving up the tying goal. A little missed coverage there in front of the net on that that power play goal. There's nobody in front. Great play, by the way. Yeah, for sure. Fantastic play, yeah. Yeah, but look, we know that the struggles that the Islanders' penalty kill has had. But, you know, all in all, I think a solid game. J.G. Pajot had a big game. You were singing his praises about the face-offs and all that. Um, This is a game where, you know, it gives you a little bit of hope. Maybe they can go into Carolina, steal another one. You never know. But the Islanders are still alive. Barzal needed that big time. Mm-hmm. Um, his first goal is obviously more impressive than the second one. Second one just hits him. That first goal was beautiful. You had Bortuzzi getting his first ever point as an Islander. You have Varlamov winning on his 36th birthday. Second time he's ever played on his birthday in his career. He lost okay. the first one. So good omen. Nice. You never want to lose on your birthday. No. And again, sure. I just thought they <laughs> played the right way, especially at 5 and 5. Possession, we'll dive into it more after we speak to Sean. Yeah. The other Sean. Um, <laughs> spelled S-H-A-W. Indeed. Your way. Yes. The right way. Um, Damn. And yeah, so, no, but it was one of those games where the Islanders just, just played the way they had to play. And you hope, with, there's a break, obviously, but you hope if they could play that way, they have as much of a chance as extending the series as they've had in every game they've played. I just think the big guy stepped up, but also you got the depth. The depth scoring is huge. Yes, it's a power play goal for Pajot. But he's not a guy that scores goal. And what Pajot didn't, like I said, we'll dive more into it. Mm-hmm. But in the face-off dot, on the power play, he brought it up. That whole line has been incredible. Yeah, no, they've been excellent. We'll talk more about it, like you said. But right now, we have to break because Sean Rourke is going to join us. So thank you all for tuning in to twitch.tv slash hockey.ny. We'll be right back. Hear it. It's over. I can't believe they fell short again. Yeah, but they played so well. They made it to the semifinals two years in a row. The semifinals aren't the cup. God damn it, I hate those lightning. They'll get another shot at it next year. I don't even want to talk about it anymore, all right? They lost, okay? Let me just sit here and enjoy the one thing that makes me a little bit happy. This fresh, delicious, tasty, meaty, turkey-filled blue line combo. I eat three every day to help keep me strong. Hey, Donnie, can I have one of those? Coming right up. Talk about a blast from the Blue Line. Blue Line Deli and Bagels. Our goal is to make you a hero.
Attention all artists, storytellers, and creators of all kinds. It's time to make your content stand out above the rest. And Floored Media is the place to make your visions become a reality. Maybe you want to elevate your podcast and add some video. Or turn that novel you wrote into an audiobook. Or maybe you just need the right space to produce your daily vlog. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, Floored Media has the professional facilities, exceptional staff, and intimate atmosphere to breathe life into your creative passions at every step of the process. Thanks for giving some time to our sponsors. Ready to talk more aisles? The train rolls on right here on Hockey Night in New York. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. The train rolls on here at Hockey Night in New York. And while we continue to wait for Sean to join us, Stefan wanted to share a little quote from Mr. Patrick Waugh. Is that correct? Yeah, we had, so we had goals yesterday. Good news for the Islanders. Yeah, yeah. Goals, but there yeah. was one common theme on all these goals. You had Barzal's goal, traffic in front with Sezikis. The second goal where Dobson shot a little bit through a screen. Anderson doesn't control the rebound as much as he wanted to. Peugeot scores that in the third goal, obviously. He's three or four guys crash and that. It goes off Barzal and in. And after the game, talking with Barzal, after the game, talking with Peugeot, and talking with Wah, everyone credited the other people that made the plays happen. And right. so I wanted to bring up, Wah was asked about Barzal's first goal, and we have this little clip here um, for what Wah had to say. Well, I mean, I will say this. It was a nice play from him, putting the puck at the net, having guys going to the net. That was huge. Um, but today it was a team effort. Today it was about, I mean, our D played a strong game. I mean, um, we were very good defensively. We were very good offensively. Not often, two games in a row, you have some uh, puck possession in, in Carolina's own over five minutes. This is, this is the number one team in the league. They're always below five-minute mark. So for us to possess that puck and then, you know, have that puck, and then the way we broke, we had our breakouts went. I mean, the way we defend... I mean, I, I, I was, like I said, that's why I said you yeah, have no idea how proud I am of this group because they were resilient, they worked hard, and, and they, they, they gathered together to, to, to come up with a big, big, big win for us. Yeah, like again, this is, every time you win a playoff game, it's got to be team-oriented. But I just thought all the plays that happened, there were individual efforts on them, but screening, and that's been a huge thing, is Anderson's, those diving save, the Dobson one, the Romanov one, He's able to make those saves because he's seeing the puck the entire time. When a goalie's on his back, if there was any kind of traffic in front of him and they just move out of the way when the shot comes, no way he picks it up. Sure. Even on the Dobson one, if there's traffic immediately mm -hmm. and he's diving, trying to also dive but stay, you know, find the puck, whether he makes a save or not, there might be a rebound. If Romanov's shot hits the top of his glove and drops down, there's Islander, there's Islander guys there. And I just think that you saw it. It was traffic, 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 and it paid off in every goal. And now going forward, they know that, okay, if we get enough traffic in front of Anderson, if he does get the start, that's another question mark. Anderson hadn't started consecutive games since coming back from injury. Mm, he hadn't started point. three straight games in a row in quite some time. Brendan Moore said the break helped, and mm -hmm. they'll get another break again. So I'll be curious. I won't be shocked if Kachekov starts the next one. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, you wonder with the extra day, right? Maybe that you know they go back to Anderson because he has played pretty well. Um, it'll be interesting to find out, and, and that'll be another challenge for the Islanders to try to put pucks on another goalie, a fresh goalie. That'll be interesting. You, maybe you, you hope that uh, the same thing that happens that happened to Sorokin <laughs> happens to him, but but we'll see. But while we continue to wait for Sean, I wanted to highlight Pierre Engvall. I thought he yeah. had an excellent game yesterday. He obviously talked about that line as a whole, playing very well. But he uh, he was in. The, I mean, he was noticeable all game, which you can't really say say that for for Pierre Engvall every game. I know that's something that <laughs> yeah. we kind of get on him about, right? And I think he's really stepped up his play here in the playoffs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I thought he was excellent and. He was busting his tail trying to beat those icings pretty much all day and didn't really work out in his favor every time. It seemed like the referee, the officials were uh, were a little uh, giving out, the benefit to the to the Carolina he beat Hurricanes. Out one. He did, he did. But he had, what do you have? At least two others. Two were blown down. The first, the second one was actually worse than the first one because the yeah. first one I said, you know what? The way the angle is, it's get to the dot. Okay. Mm. Second one, I was like, what are we? Uh, yeah. Thankfully, yeah. the Islanders won faceoffs because right. who knows what right. happens. You look at the Jarvis goal. Again, they had won 24 of 28 of the first 28 faceoffs. One of their four losses led to the Jarvis uh, power play goal. Yeah. And so it's always about when those happen. But you talk about Engvall and five on five, it was great. Mm -hmm. He takes that faceoff on the Pajot power play goal. He wins it. Right. In theory, he wins it. It goes a little sideways, sure. but Lee jumps on it. Mm -hmm. Karen Engvall's not a faceoff guy. He is not. And he... In a big moment, taking the face. He off. has played center, but no, he's not. A but face he's not a big guy. face. That's right. the reason why he no longer plays center. Correct. Um. So 
him winning that big face-off. That's the only way that goal happens because if they right. lose that face-off, puck comes out. Who knows that group even gets back in the zone? Yeah, no, I, I think he's been excellent. I think he's a guy who, who deserves a little bit of praise here. We talked about McLean a little bit. I don't know if you want to expand on that. But just a guy who we weren't expecting coming into this team and uh, just been a standout guy. You mentioned the fact that he was fighting, a lot of energy there. And and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's just another way for the Islanders to get younger and faster as well, right? Kind of like a diamond in the rough here you weren't expecting. Now all of a sudden it looks like he's going to be a big part of the bo bottom six for this team. Kyle McLean is one of those guys that well, definitely pulling a fashing this year in terms of being yes. that guy that can't come out. Now, yes. fashing hasn't been the fashion he was last year. Right. Had an right. injury at the end of camp. I think that that kind of impacted things for him. But you saw, I was watching game three and I thought, all right, McLean sparked, you know, in game one of the series, no Peugeot. Peugeot was hurt, so McLean plays right. third line center. Mm -hmm. All right, sparks that line. I thought that line was pretty good. Game two, Pajot's back, McLean's in the fourth line. I thought fourth line actually played pretty good in that game. Mm -hmm. And then during game three, you need a spark. And I'm thinking, just put McLean in the top line. You need to get Horvath and Barzal going. And eventually, why does it? He says after the game that he did it because Zeke is not used to double shifting as much. So they put McLean there. And there was a percent chance that we thought McLean would start game four in that top line. But you saw mm -hmm. yesterday in overtime. Same thing. I think McLean has done exactly what he's had to do on every single line he's been on going forward. Whether he's your, he just showed that he could be your four C, your three C, your your left winger on line one. He's one of those guys that does those little things, mm -hmm. and he's young. He's only he's not young, young. He's twenty five years old, but he's young and he understands how to play with certain players. He changes the way he plays, the positive way. If he's playing with Barzal, he knows all right. Get Barzal the puck. If he's playing on the fourth line. He's generating off the rush. So I think McLean has been spectacular. Right on, right on. I believe Sean is ready to go. If you want to bring him in. Is that the case, fellas? That is not the case. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> All right. So, anyway, getting back to talking about these guys here, what do, what do you make of the, the big guns in this series so far? Talking about Barzell, Horvat, Nelson, Noah Dobson. Yeah, I think they've been too quiet. You need them to step up. I, I think what happened with the top line is you had Tzizekas on that line, and you thought, in theory, just a younger Anders Lee. He could win the battles in the corners, get the pucks up, and get to the net much quicker. The problem that I feel like they ran into with that line is that they got so caught up in the dump and chase. Mm -hmm. You know, in game two, when the island, when they're up 3-1 or 3-2, at that point, I remember Horvat had a chance to transition and skate into the Carolina zone. Mm -hmm. He goes for a dump. The problem with the Islanders is that they weren't winning those dump and chase battles at all. They lost. They lose the board right. battle, and the Carolina Hurricanes would break out, and you thought, okay, if the Islanders are going to find a way to get back in this series, especially that line, they have to possess. And you saw it. Matthew Barzal didn't dump and chase on that play. He took it, brought it into the zone, ended up coming back, and they score goals. So I think for them, top line has to trust that they could be individual a little bit. Barzal and Horvath could drive the play. Same thing with the second line, and it's a trickle-down effect for sure with those guys. But I think they need more from those top guys, and I think that'll give a lot of confidence the way Barzal and Horvath played the other day. No question about it. And joining us on the line right now from NHL.com is Mr. Sean Rock. Sean, thanks so much for joining us. How you doing? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Sorry about the mix-up. Oh, no worries. No worries. Great to have you here. Great to be talking New York Islanders and Carolina Hurricanes hockey here. The series goes on. Maybe we can just start with a with a simple question. What do you make of the series so far and, and the Islanders uh, extending a little bit here? Well, I, I make it to be a much closer series than I think a lot of people on the outside have it pegged as, right? Like, I, you think about it, without the empty net goals, it's four one-goal games. And, I, you know, I covered Carolina last year in the playoffs, and that's pretty much all they do is play one-goal games. The last four games they played in the playoffs last year against Florida were all one-goal games. One of them was four overtimes. The other one was one overtime. So they're used to close games. Obviously, the Islanders are used to close games as well. Both teams are kind of trying to grind it out. So, you know, I think if you're just walking into the series, you, you're like, oh, wow, Carolina's really dominated. But I, I don't think that's been the case at all. Hey, Sean, thanks so much for joining us. You wrote a story today for .com on, on Varlamov. Just how... How surprised have you been with the way he's been able to play, especially when he didn't play too much during this regular season? Well, obviously he was really good down the stretch when when you needed him, and he has that pedigree, right? Uh, especially, you know, coaches are funny; like they're comfortable with certain players and and certain roles. And I, I think it's the same thing with goaltenders. Sometimes a coach gets comfortable with somebody because there's there's a sample size, right? And Patrick Wall has a three-year sample size with 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 Varlamov. So I, I, I think there's a comfort level there. And Ilya was obviously struggling a little bit. I think he was run down a little bit. He, they relied him on a relied on him too much. And and Varley's delivered. Look, he's got a better save percentage than Freddie Anderson, and everybody's singing Freddie Anderson's praises, and rightly so. 
Um, but Varley's at 930 and Anderson's at 920. So uh, to me, the most amazing thing, I think, was when Patrick Waugh decided to play Sorokin in game three. It didn't work out. Varley came in shut the door, gave the Islanders a chance to win that game, and then probably played his best game the next game. There's a lot of goalies in this league that would have pouted and would not have been at their best after being removed, after not playing bad at all, and after being left out to dry, honestly, in game two. I, I mean, he was like Denny Lemieux in slap shot for the last two periods. <laughs> like, that's what it reminded me of. Uh, there was so much possession in his end. And, and, you know, people look and say, oh, big deal. He faced 38 shots. He faced 122 shot attempts. Yeah, they didn't get through. They were blocked or they missed. That's mentally taxing. Like, he worked really hard in that game. And, and like I said, to be replaced in game three when it might not have been merited and then to finish up that game and come back in game four and play your best and, and help the team survive, to me, that's such a statement of who he is and what his character is about. Absolutely, Sean. I think it's just been so impressive to see how poised and calm and control Varlamov has been. It's, I mean, you wouldn't even think it's the playoffs, right? It just looks like he's going out there and it's it's any other game. He's He's been so poised out there. But just before you came on, Steph and I were starting to talk about the Islanders' big guns, the guys that are supposed to put pucks in the net. Obviously, Barzell came through big time yesterday in Game 4, and I just wanted to get your opinion on how guys like Horvat, Nelson, Noah Dobbs have been playing so far in the series. I think they've been okay, but it really hasn't been a big gun series, right? Like you look at the you look at the Carolina Hurricanes, their big guns aren't going. They want more from them. Um, you know, is Stefan Nosen's been one of their Nason's been one of their best players. Um, you know, and he he's a fourth line guy. It, Kuznetsov's been one of their best players. He's a fourth line guy. So you know, I I, I think. Matt Barzell said it yesterday. He's never been involved in a series where there, there's such a premium on ice. And, and to me, the the Carolina Hurricanes forecheck is ferocious. Not in a physical sense where they're just beating you up, but in a sense of frustrating and suffocating. You have to work so hard to get the puck up the ice. By the time you get there, you're exhausted and you need to change. And that's a really good way to play defense. You know, we all talk about how good their defense is, and they go four deep. I, I might even argue they go five deep. Five deep. Uh, Chatfield's really impressed me in watching him in these four games, and he stepped up a little bit when Pesci was hurt and played a little bit more. But, um, you know, one way to play really good defense is to wear the other team out and have no, for, for them to have nothing left, especially their big guns when they get in the offensive zone. And I think that's been a lot of what this is, is guys like Matt Borzell and, and Bo Horvat are working so hard to get the puck into the areas they want it to be that they're frustrated and they're tired. And Sean, we have, we were just talking to you about comma clean. Again, you also wrote a story on that as well. Just did you, you didn't, I don't, I'm assuming you didn't see this coming from him. And I guess how impressed have you been for a guy that an older guy put in his dues in the minors gets a chance with the Islanders. And you could argue he's probably been their best spark player energy wise this series. He's certainly been one of them for sure. And he's a coach's son, right? So you're never surprised because they're just smarter and that's not a knock on anybody else, but they just live the game in a different way, right? Like you talk with your son or I talk with my son, you know, my son played soccer his whole life and I talked to him about it. I know a little bit about soccer, but I, I don't know what Lionel Messi knows. I don't know what <laughs> Alexi Lawless knows. Like there's an inherent, advantage in, in being a coach's son there's some disadvantages too for sure um but there's an inherent advantage in being a coach's son in the education that you get right it's not a passive education it's an it's an active education um so I, I i'm not surprised at all that he understands the nuances of the game he understands multiple roles and can play multiple roles he's a little faster than i thought he was when i had first watched him uh you know he's I, to me he's had an extra step in the playoffs and he's fearless right i, I think again you know that showed when he decided that he was going to tangle with Stefan Nason. That's a huge step up for him. Um, you know, I, not that Stefan's a, a, a true heavyweight, but he is a big veteran kid. Um, Texas strong, right? And and <laughs> Kyle showed no fear. And, and I thought that really, you know, set the tone for them for, for a little bit. I think as players, you respect when you see somebody go out of their comfort zone and do that. So I, I think Kyle's been great. And I think Patrick Law thinks he's been great because he's moved them all over the place.
No question, Sean. We've been very impressed with his play. And you talked about Carolina's just suffocating forecheck. And obviously it's something that the Islanders have struggled with. But this is also something that they've been struggling with all season long. And it doesn't even matter if it's the Carolina Hurricanes. It's just been, been an issue for this team. Typically when they have a lead where for whatever reason they just have this issue with clearing zones, clearing pucks, even getting that next goal to put them over the top. And it really reared its head, obviously, in game two when the Islanders had that big 3 nothing lead. And the, they just had no answer for the Carolina Hurricanes. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, especially from an Islander sp standpoint, when you watch them struggle as they have in those situations, is there anything that you can see there that's like, okay, this is why it's happening. This is what's going on. You have a lot of people saying, ah, well, they're old and slow. But is there anything you're seeing out there that makes you say, okay, the Islanders need to change this up because they're having a real problem here? Well, I think slow does factor into it. I, I just think, and it's not even foot speed, right? That's a huge part of it, but it's just in decision-making as well. I, I, I thought in this series, right, in game one, Carolina won. They weren't at their best. They weren't in playoff shape. The Islanders were, you know, and I, I thought the Islanders kind of took it to them a little bit. And, and you know, Freddie played really well. And, and then at the beginning of game two, it was the same thing. They were kind of sleeping. And it seemed like in the second period, they just threw caution to the wind because they were down 3 nothing, and they got to their game, and they had their legs, and that's when they become scary, right? And they, they're they so hyper-aggressive. And part of it's because of their defense. They're, they they trust their defense so much that they're not afraid on the penalty kill and at even strength to just pressure the puck and not worry about it getting behind them because of the recovery speed they have. And to me, the Islanders take time to move the puck up. They're not a one-two pass. Sometimes you watch Carolina get out of their zone and it's bang, it's at the blue line and bang, it's at the other blue line and off they go. Um, and, and you don't see the Islanders do that much. I thought they did it more in games three and four and they worked on it before game three. That's what a huge part of that practice was before game three. You know, they went a little extra long, Steph told me, and a lot of it was spent on breakouts and, and Patrick Wall was really engaged. He was yelling and banging his stick and, you know, actually showing them illustrating exactly what he wanted done and i thought there was more attention to detail in games three and four but i don't care who you are you're going to have trouble against that four check when you have guys like you know jordan stall coming in on you um jarvis players like that they just really fetch nikoff right to me he's such a prototypical power forward and nobody thinks of him that way but he is quick on the four check he's mean you know he's got a big body um and, and I think in a series like this, it's cumulative. When you think about the goal that won the game, the Dobson turnover behind the net, like that was a cumulative 40 minutes of just getting hasted right. on the backboards, right? And and the whole idea about it, and I spoke to a number of players on both teams about this, the whole idea of a forecheck like that in a series like this is psychological. Make the other guy think about what he wants to do, where he wants to be, and make him get rid of it faster. And I think all those things came home to roost when, you know, Noah turned it over. I, I just think there was a cumulative effect where you take so many hits and are under duress so many times that there becomes a hesitation in your game. Yeah, that you nailed it there too. The forge, I guess, what helps is when you win faces like the Islanders did right. last game. But you yeah. mentioned you mentioned Wa. I wanted to bring up. You've been around him a little bit now. What are your thoughts of him now in his second stint as an NHL head coach? And how do you feel his fit is with this Islanders team? I think his fits really good, and and I've been a little bit surprised that his intensity is still there, but it's it's not as white hot and it's not as at the surface, right? He's right. a little more controlled about what he does. I, I love that he says, "I'm not going to go there." Here's what I'll say: like he's already thought about it, and and you know he he knows what he's going to say, and he does send some messages, I think, through the media. Um, but I, I think he's been much more controlled in, in that. I think, you know, he's a part of this team. I thought his comments after game four about how proud he was of the team, you know, and, and all of that is is testament to the investment that he's made into this team and, and the belief that he has in them. And I think that's born out of the end of the season, right? And going on that run and making a statement and, and saying we belong here and this is who we are. I, I, I think when you get invested in that way, you can't help but do that. And I also think Patrick's a better teacher than I thought he was. A lot of times really great players have a hard time teaching because they can't do 
other players can't do what they do. And I think it's a little different for Patrick because he wasn't a skater. Like there's no frustration in, you know, why can't you Pierre Engvall, why can't you do what I did when I played? <laughs> and I'm just using Pierre as an example. I'm not saying that he's not a good player, but like, you know, you think about Wayne Gretzky being a coach and nobody could do or think like he did. So it becomes very frustrating. But with Patrick being a goalie, I don't think that's the case, right? And so I think it's a little easier. And it seems to me he stays a little bit away from the goaltenders and knows what his lane is. And I think that also makes it easier because it has to be intimidating as a goalie, you know, to to play for Patrick Waugh and, and how great he was. But I, I think the biggest takeaway I've taken from being around him for a little over a week now is the fact that he's super intense still and and super committed to winning. I don't think he'd become one of the greatest players in the history of any sport without having that competitive fire, but I think he's learned how to harness it a little bit more constructively. You know, Sean, you just you just mentioned the fact that it's got to be intimidating for a goalie to play for a guy like Patrick Waugh, and you look at the season that Sorokin's had, you obviously look at the game that he had in Game 3, and do you think that could have something to do with it there with not only playing for Patrick Waugh, but also the previous relationship that he has or had with Semyon Varlamov at the Colorado Avalanche? <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of things play into it, right? It's such a psychological position. I, I think Ilya Sorokin is just he's been run down, right? Like I, I thought he played a lot of games in a row. Um, you know, I thought they really wrote him pretty hard, hard in the middle of the season. And, you know, he wasn't the same goal tender. He was last year. Look, goalies go into slumps. They're just like everybody else. Um, and, and, you know, and then Varley kind of stepped up and, and, and it becomes very difficult. I don't think that this has much to do with Patrick. Right. And other than the fact that he's the coach and he's making the decisions. And I do think, there is a comfort level with Varley because he's done it for Patrick before. And and clearly, you know, we all have that. If somebody's done a bunch of good stories for me, I'm going to go to them before I go to somebody else that's not as proven to me, right? It might be just as good a writer. Um, so I, I, I think that plays a little into it. And I and I think Ilya just needs a reset. I, I mean, we're yeah. talking about obviously a Vezina Trophy finalist, you know, a player who was really good, much like Varley last year in a six game loss was really good in, in that series, you know, that doesn't go away. I, I, I just think that there's something there. And, and I thought it was a really, you know, Patrick Waugh called it the perfect position to put in um, Ilya Sorokin. I, I thought it was a really tough position to put him in, you know, very much like we talked about Carolina not being at playoff speed in game one and really kind of being in trouble and swimming to stay alive, right. Being deep in the weeds. I, I thought Ilya was deep in the weeds because he wasn't ready for that speed, I don't think. And that's not a knock on him. You can't replicate what happens in a playoff game in practice. I don't care how hard the guys go. You can't replicate the traffic, the 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 chaos, the, everything. Everything's just turned up like Spinal Tap. It's turned up to 11, <laughs> and there's no way to get ready for that. You know, I thought the same thing, and I wanted to ask Patrick, and I never got a chance. He talks about how hard – it is to play against the Carolina power play, a penalty kill because of how aggressive they are. One of the reasons it's hard to play against them with how aggressive they are is you can't practice against it. You can't teach your guys in three days to kill penalties that way when you're running in and practice. It's like in college when a football team plays the run and shoot. It's a one-week thing. You can't practice against it, so you just cross your fingers. Or when you play Army, that's the only time you're going to see the wishbone, right? And you just cross your fingers, and you hope you figure it out in a week because there's no way to scout team against it. And I think that's the case against, you know, Carolina with their penalty kill, and I think that's the case with goaltenders when you put them in cold into a series that's already underway. Right on, Sean. And the last one from me, obviously you know what the odds were stacked up against the Islanders when they went down 3 to nothing. Now it's 3-1. to one. Uh, you, you mentioned how it has been a close series in the sense that the scores have been tight. The Islanders have been playing the Canes very well despite the disparity in their skill level, despite the disparity in their in their standings level during the year. Do they have a shot at uh, taking Game 5 and forcing the Game 6 at home? I'm a Red Sox fan. Oh. I've seen the story. <laughs> so, a 3 0 come back, right? Like, it's happened. So, of course, it can happen, mm. right? And and I don't think there was anybody in New York at the time, and, and not to open any wounds for any New York Yankee fans out there, but I don't <laughs> think there was anybody here. I know there was nobody here because I live in New Jersey and it's torture as a New Englander, but I know there was nobody here who thought at that point that the Red Sox were going to come back and win that series. It looks so bleak. 
And when I told my wife it was going to happen, she said that I was a sad, sad human and that she felt sorry. <laughs> but I think you have to have that belief. And I think that the Islanders gave themselves that belief. I don't know that they have it all the way to come back mm. all the way, right? Only four teams have ever done it. Um, and this is a really, really good team that they're playing. But if you're asking me if they can win game five, I, I definitely think they can. A, they did it last year. B, Rod Brindamore admitted it, right? Like, it's really hard to sweep a team. And then once you give them a little bit of momentum and, and you're running into a hot goalie, like, when when does Carolina start to question itself? When does guys like Jake Gensel start to question themselves and, and Aho and say, why can't we generate anything against this guy? We're way better than them. Why won't the goals come? And I think once you get into players' heads, the series changes completely. So I, I, I think they can win game five. And look, I also think you have to worry a little bit about Freddie, right? He's been really good. I was surprised he played in game four. He's going to play in game five because there's two and a half days off before it. But Freddie Anderson hasn't played in back-to-back -back games until these playoffs since he came back from his blood clotting issue. He hadn't played in four straight games since last year's playoffs. So they're really trying to manage his minutes. And now they're getting deeper into a series where, you know, at some point they're probably going to have to think about going to Kachetkov. And we just talked about what happened and going to Sorokin. I think it gets harder and harder the deeper the series goes. So I, I think there's a wear and tear factor on Freddie Anderson that you have to worry about. And, and I think if they can go into Raleigh and into a really hostile building and, and, you know, they've played two one-goal games there, if they find a way to turn it around – then there's a whole new series of questions that gets asked for the final two games of this series. So I, I think there's still a lot of interesting things to play out here. No question about it. Did you have something to say there? No, we'll close it out. We're good. Oh, fair yeah. enough. Well, Sean, really appreciate the time. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the playoffs and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Yeah, a pleasure to do it. Sorry about being a little late, and hopefully we see you guys back on the island for game six. All good. Absolutely. Let's hope. Take care, Sean. Great stuff from Thanks, him. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. So there you have it. That was Sean Rourke of NHL.com. Great stuff. And he thinks they also have a shot in game five. Yeah, there's. A, I mean, there's a lot <laughs> to dive into with what he said because the four check is the biggest thing. And I, I joked about it with the face-offs, but mm -hmm. you know, they say the best defense is offense, right? If the Islanders possess the puck a lot more and break the pucks out, they get away from the, They are able to escape that four check, and that's how they were able to have success yesterday. Right. We saw what happened in game three, uh, in game two. They could not escape the forward taking. Once they got into that rhythm, it was impossible. They couldn't break the puck out. They would dump in chains. They do that thing where they flip the puck out into the neutral zone, get picked mm -hmm. off. Right. They possessed yesterday. And when they were able to possess, they disallowed the forward from being as effective. They got on their own forward check, which allowed for more cycles and shots on goal and traffic. So, yeah, the way to beat this Hurricanes team is to not allow them to get into that rhythm. And that just starts from playing your game early. You could allow the first goal, like we saw in that game where Sorokin gets pulled. It wasn't great performance by him, but they played pretty well. They don't allow a lot of high danger shots. Right. And again, what, where Hurricanes dominate is that they shoot from everywhere. And you never know when mm -hmm. you shoot a puck, it'll just go. And I think the Islanders are also starting to realize that. Bortuzzo just shooting it. Barzal right. really pulling yes. up. There wasn't a, I mean, there wasn't much to shoot. It goes off the post and in, but Barzal's mm -hmm. just shooting it. Um, Dobson on the power play. He's just, that's not a shot that he's shooting to score on. That's right. just, let me get a puck towards net. And I mean, exactly. the Islanders, game after game, I think they start to figure out, especially... In different areas, that's one way to do it. Uh, how aggressive their D are. The Islanders in that game when they got up through nothing, but, mm -hmm. you know, Horvat gets in the breakaway in that game, right? Mm -hmm. They had chances where they, okay, they're so aggressive uh, with their defenders that if we get the puck behind them, we're going to have fast breaks and odd man rushes. And you saw Barzal pass up a two on one in game three and things like that. But mm -hmm. you're slowly starting mm -hmm. to see as the series goes on, the Islanders are figuring out ways to beat this team. Yeah, I agree, and, and we talked about it before the show also that we were starting to see more shots from the point, and, and maybe it's not the most ideal guys getting shots, but you saw a, a decent amount of shots from Pelic, Romanov, and, of course, Bertuzzo that ends up going in the net, but it was encouraging just to see more pucks coming from the blue line because I feel like they weren't doing that enough, so maybe that's something they, they bring over into Game 5 where you know they have a little more success there, and, and yeah, maybe we'll be at Game 6 for, for, for one more game, for one more hurrah at the Islanders' home ice, um, but we're going to take one more break. Before we do, going to tell 
tell you all about Main Street Board Game Cafe in Huntington Village on Long Island's North Shore. Games for sale and for open play. Food and drink, beer and wine, fun and friends. Bring the magic of phones down, eyes up, tabletop board games to your family. Our staff will help you find the right game from old favorites to the hottest new releases. We have everything from strategic to easy party games. Get off your screens for a night your family will remember. Looking for meetups to join? Our Magic the Gathering Dungeons and Dragons, Lorcana, and organized play communities are welcoming for all. We also do parties and corporate events. Located at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Go to mainstboardgamecafe.com for more information. Main Street Board Game Cafe. Find your crowd. Unplug a game. And now we will take a break. And then the train rolls on. Islanders fans, Sunday night is hockey night in New York. Whether you were raised at the barn in Uniondale or born in the stable at Belmont, tune in to Hockey Night in New York. Catch us live from Floored Media in Rockville Center, Sunday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, as we cover all things Islanders at twitch.tv slash hockey night NY. All episodes are also available on YouTube and all your favorite podcast providers. And for all you social butterflies, you can follow at Hockey Night NY on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for all the latest updates. Hockey Night in New York. The best night of the week for any Islanders fan. And now, it's time for What's on Tap. A look ahead at the Islanders' upcoming schedule. That's right, folks. It's time for What's on Tap. And wouldn't you believe it, the Islanders have a game coming up on Tuesday against the Carolina Hurricanes. <laughs> game 5 in rally. And as of right now, that's it. That's the only game that is on tap. The Islanders have to decide if Game 6 will be on tap Thursday. And then maybe Game 7 on tap on Saturday, right? Thursday, yeah. Saturday? I don't know. You were the schedule breaker. Yeah, I guess so. Well, that's what's on tap. <laughs> I'm not going any further than Tuesday. Going into Carolina, big game five. Listen, I'm encouraged by the way they've been playing in this series. And, and again, we can make all the jokes about game two all we want. But I do think that the Islanders have acclimated themselves well against the Canes. Has it been pretty every game for 60 minutes? Absolutely not. Have the Canes shown where they're superior over the Islanders? They absolutely have. I'm certainly not going into Game 5 expecting a win out of the Islanders, but I think it's possible. I, I err on the show, uh, side of caution there with Sean, where I, I definitely think it's possible, but Varley has to keep playing the way he's playing. Which I'm not I'm not nervous about at all. If you're an Islander fan, you shouldn't be. He's been the definition of, he goes there and does his job every game. He's so. been excellent, and they just, listen... It was encouraging to see them come out the way they did yesterday because they could have just thrown the towel in. They could have just said, ah, you know, Saturday afternoon, let's run off into the sunset here. Let's start, you know, booking some some tea times, right? Oh, they're already booked for most for like vacations and <laughs> they, stuff. They, not they, not they, tea times, maybe the vacation sure, booked. Maybe sure. Later in the summer. But the point is, is that they didn't just, you know, roll over and yeah. say, Here you go, Carolina. You know, have fun in the second round. You know? They fought. They fought and they said, We're not done yet. So if they can muster that same kind of energy on Tuesday, I say, why not? And again, we know the, the odds are stacked against them. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the Islanders are going to come back and win this series in seven, but one game at a time. We'll see what happens on Tuesday. Like Sean said, four teams have ever done it. The Islanders are one of those four teams. 1975 <laughs> right. against the Penguins. Then they also did it, at, was it the next round or in the finals? I think it was against Philly, and back then Philly was in the other... They could play them in the cup, but they were also down 3 mm -hmm. nothing. I believe it was the semis right after that because they didn't make okay. the finals then. Yeah. Semis, they went down 3 nothing, made it 3-3, but then lost in Game 7. Mm -hmm. But the Islanders have done it. Different group. <laughs> the roster was <laughs> a little bit different. Technology was a little different back then. <laughs> Everything was different. Uh, <laughs> right. But for the Islanders, there's some question marks in the lineup. Ishikov played. Uh, Ishakov. We have to get it right. It's Ishakov. It's Ishakov? Ishakov. Ishakov. It's on is, the ha. That is... Like a joke. That is very difficult. Yeah. Ishakov. Yeah. Or Rusty. Call him Rusty. And now that you bring up his name, I know he only got in for like six minutes and change, but anything you saw out there from him? I asked, I thought he was provided the energy that sparked. Okay. I thought he made one good play where he slowed the game down. Mm -hmm. There was a chance for him to go up the ice and probably someone really nervous would want to do that, especially when you have the speed that he has. Mm -hmm. He skid stops, goes back and reset the play and allowed the honors to get set. Don't know how the, I don't think the play ended up in a goal, but mm -hmm. I asked Watt post game, you know, he didn't play a lot of minutes. So what do you think? And he, and he laughed and he goes, he was pretty, like, he was all right, joking right, around. Right, right. And he's like, it's a very hard thing for a player to do is go into that. He was poised. He played well. He gave us, a, this was the big thing is that he gave us exactly what we thought he would give us. Sure. Okay. Which is big. Matt Martin, lower body injury. We know that he was going through something probably the entire year. Mm -hmm. He missed a lot of time in the first half. Remember, he comes back, suffers the setback, right. in and out of the lineup. And then in the playoffs, he gets hurt. We don't know if he's going to play. It was a game-time decision for Game 3. Ends up mm -hmm. playing in Game 3. Right. 
and then he gets ruled out. So we don't know the extent of the injury. It's day to day. We think he's travel. We'll see tomorrow when they practice, but mm -hmm. we're expecting him to travel to Carolina. Um, but yeah, if he doesn't get in, right, and this series does end, and he doesn't get to play again, right, pending UFA. It's been tough to watch at times him this year. You love mm -hmm. the guy to death, the way right. he's played. He's Everyone forgets the two years he spent in Toronto because it was should, one should never have probably happened. And sure. he comes back here, and he's just been the definition of an Islander on and off the ice. Talk about the the alumni, the, the Nystroms, all those guys, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what they meant. You're talking about in 20 or 30 years. That's Everyone's going to be looking at Mark Martin and Casey Zekas and Cal Clutterbeck as three guys that did it the Islander way. And I think anyone could knock Martin for how he played this year, but... Just the way he's carried himself, even when the game's kind of passing by a little bit, he's never mm -hmm. stopped trying. He's always tried to be that guy. In the room, you know, he's a leader, whether he wore an A ever or not with this group. He is just the guy that everyone loves to be around and be a part of, and I think if that was it for him, he had a fantastic career. Yeah, without a doubt, but hopefully we're talking about more hits from, from Matt Martin on the ice, whether it's hits literally or scoring some goals, whatever it is. But, I mean, you think he gets in game five if he's healthy, right? Per Watt, Watt said if he was healthy enough to play, he would have played. Right, okay. Um, and again, I think people knocked him this series. I don't think he... That line has been what was it? Wasn't it game three where Martin and Clutterbuck only had one shift in the third? Am I so off that was that? yesterday. It was so yesterday. So yesterday they played... Um, they didn't play the final five minutes of the third. Clutterbuck or um, Ishikov. Didn't play the final. I think the last shift was 5 away. They didn't touch the ice in overtime, and they didn't touch the ice in the second overtime either. Mm -hmm. But Matt Martin also got hurt. In, deal different injury. He took that clutterbug yeah, shot. Yeah, so it had to be game three because Martin was was in the lineup. Yeah. But I, I'm pretty sure I read a stat that game three that Martin and Clutterbuck only had one shift in the third Yeah, period. so they were also double uh, double shifting McLean in that game mm -hmm. also. So mm -hmm. I think they took those guys out again when the, when the minutes add up. And Wah's going to trust his gut. That's the other thing, too, is with Wah and the difference between Lane, just not knocking the way Lane did things, Wah is not scared to change things up. He makes these right. in-game adjustments and... This is where the separation is with him and Lane is that was coached before as a head coach mm -hmm. at the NHL level. Sure. It's not, you know, juniors obviously helped Wa understand how to manage his anger and all that stuff. But <laughs> for Lane being an assistant, you know, he wasn't ever in charge of the bench the way he was as an Islander coach where Wa did it with the avalanche full control of how to handle star players and players of that level on a good team. The avalanche were really good that year. Varlamov mm -hmm. was unreal for them where Wa won the Jack Adams. And then he goes down to the minors, uh, juniors, where he's coaching young guys. I think Wa understands how to read these players, maybe a little more than Lane did. Again, mm -hmm. outside voice. You don't know any one minutes at all. That's right. the biggest difference. He, the right. first week on the job, Wa cut the fourth line minutes. He was double shifting in that mm -hmm. Dallas game. He was double shifting that whole week. Right. And you said, this is the end of the, we're going to run four lines evenly, and the fourth line's going to be out there in those big moments. Now, Wallace well, played the fourth line at times during these series, sure. but in the big moments, they're not playing. He knows that he's got a double shift bars on. He knows that even if he's double shifting two of the three guys, he doesn't have to double shift the entire line, which is right. why you have McLean going up, or you have Pajot if you need to be to double shift. Mm -hmm. So I think Wallace well, done a phenomenal job of not getting out coached by Brendan Moore. Now, the matchup game is something you can't really help when you're on the road. And that's right. like that line, um, the stall line was just abusing the Nelson line. Mm -hmm. Where at home, first off, Wa came in and said he wasn't nervous about having that be the matchup at all. Mm -hmm. But you're seeing Wa, you know, you're seeing when D'Angelo is out there, Barzal's line's going out there. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's understanding exactly what he has to do to give them more success. And I think Pesci's injury, which we didn't talk about at all. Right. The longer this series go, the more of that's going to affect them. Because sure. D'Angelo, you know, he's the offensive guy, but... Like you mentioned, Shotfield's probably one of the better underrated defensemen in the league. Mm -hmm. But when Daniel's out there, he's now their weakness. They have a weakness where you went into the series and said, each D pair does not have a weakness at all. Right. There's now a weakness to exploit, and the Islanders tried to do that. And I don't remember exactly which Hurricanes are on the on the ice for X amount of goals. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to guarantee a lot of the chances the Islanders got in that game probably came from that bottom pairing, being, uh, that D'Angelo pairing being out there. That's a good point. That's a good point. Well, why don't we uh, talk about her heroes now? Yes. And go into the hero of the week. Ladies and gentlemen, when you hear this song, that means it's time for the Hero of the Week, brought to you by the Blue Line Deli and Bagels Half Price Hero, which this week is the Blue Liner, featuring chicken cutlet, bacon, melted American Russian dressing on a toasted garlic hero. Stop on in to the Blue Line Deli and Bagels Huntington location for half off the Blue Liner. All you got to do is mention Hockey Night in New York. Simple. So with that out of the way, Stefan Rosner, who's your hero? Here is Islanders captain Andrews Lee. Not only is he the only player on either side of a point in every game, he's got a goal and three assists, and a play yesterday where he gets that assist is the power play goal we talked about with Pajot. Engvall takes the draw, and easily Hurricanes could have gotten to that puck first and cleared it down. Lee jumps on it, gets it back to Dobson, 
gets a shot off Pajot, scores. But besides that, the battle mentality we've seen from Andrews Lee, you know, early in the year, his play wasn't great. His leadership was questioned the entire year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the playoffs right now, he has led by example in every board battle. When it's Whether it's in the corners or you saw it a lot of times in yesterday's game is they're fighting at the blunt to just get the puck out of their own zone. And mm -hmm. Lee's making that extra push to make it out. He showed fire. Taking the Orlov elbow to the face and standing up for himself, which again, if that gets called a penalty, probably not ideal. But he's not back down. He scored some big goals. He makes it three yeah. nothing in mm -hmm. game two. And in theory, that should have been enough. Yes. But he has, you know, Pajot might be that line that's really driving that line. But the way Lee and Engvall have won puck battles and things like that's been amazing. Pajot said, when you see a guy doing that, it's contagious. Seeing how hard your right. captain's working, mm -hmm. and for as much as he's gotten, you know what, for being the captain, he's been right. exactly what you want your captain to be in this in these playoffs. So yeah, far. listen, can't take it away from him. He's he's definitely stepped up. I mean, you can say what you want about his foot speed, and and maybe he's over that part of the hill where he's not maybe worth as much as his contract is right now on the salary cap. But he has had a very good series, and he has kind of you know taken this team on his shoulders a bit here, and and, and led very well in the series. So hat tip to him, hat tip to you for picking him, and I am going with Semyon Varlamov. I got to go with him again. I went with him last week and as we've been saying just having an outstanding series one and two obviously with the record 2.08 goals against average 930 save percentage and again just a stalwart back there I mean has he had any shutouts has he stopped every puck no he hasn't but he's stopped the pucks that he's needed to stop he's been excellent and outside of that misguided penalty that he took in game two I think he's just been fantastic and in a spot where, again, he had to step up behind, you know, a Vezina caliber goaltender who's having a rough year and he gets in there and he says, no problem. He gets the job done and he's a big reason why the Islanders aren't going home yet. And boy, does he make Lou Lamoureux look really good. Imagine sure they does. don't bring Varley back. Yes. Two, two ways this goes if they don't bring Varley back. They sign a cheap backup that probably can't win you games. Might keep you in games, can't win you games. Mm -hmm. They call up a guy from Bridgeport like Skark, who's clearly not ready, or an Appleby or whatever. Yeah. Or they try to just hope that Sorokin ends in struggles and they kill him even more by playing him as much as possible. If if Varlamov wasn't there, they don't even make the playoffs. No, he is, you know, there's no he's not gonna win a heart, obviously, but he's right. their MVP on their stretch. Him and Palmieri. Right. Um Definitely. both. But you just look at Varley and he's just again, he controls his rebounds so well. He's so structured. Because even on the on the chances right and tight, the rebounds are controlled, and the players have all talked about it, is that it allows them to relax. You talk about how calm he is in there. Mm -hmm. When the players are all nervous and they see a goalie that's, you know, sharp angle shot to the corner, that save he made yesterday where Nelson tries to take it out from below the goal and skate right in front of Varley, gets picked off Teravine and shoots it through a screen. Varlamov's like, yeah, you know. Shoulder right to the corner. <laughs> no problem. Where most goalies yeah. in that situation, one, it probably goes in cleanly, or two, it mm -hmm. just pops right back out to Teravine and in stride mm -hmm. who could just tap it home. Right. Nope. Controlled rebound, tracked it through traffic, right to the corner. They could breathe. It's not chaotic. And I don't want to take a knock at Sorokin on right. this, but his lack of rebound control definitely played in part in how bad the defense was in front of him because they couldn't read what was going to happen. It was chaos, at least with Varley, whether it's going to the corner or it's just a lot of times Varlamov makes a save and it stops right there. And the defense mm -hmm. knows, okay, if I just box out, we're good. He'll cover it. Mm -hmm. So that's something Sorokin has to get better at to just help his D more because it's a game changer at all when there's trust. I'm not saying they don't trust Sorokin. They do. Mm -hmm. But it's clear as day that they're responding much better when Varlamov's in goal. I think that is very, very clear to see. So, folks, there are your heroes of the week, Anders Lee and Semyon Varlamov. And now I think it's time to go to the Snake Den. Welcome to the Snake Den with Jake the Snake Redemption. All set, buddy. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I don't got the. Uh, <laughs> it's all this good. Time. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys noticed, but I'm growing a playoff beard too. We're in the same between boat. Between the we're, two yeah, of yeah. you, yeah. I mean, I'm you guys are really, really putting together some strong beards. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, listen, maybe if you combine not, them into one, you guys would be. If right. we look, that combine into one, we'll look like great. Kyle Palmieri. <laughs> I was literally going to say that not all of us have Kyle Palmieri jeans. No, who no, probably we don't. grew a beard before the second period of the first game. That's probably and, true. And the skill to play hockey at that high level. Yes, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Ilya Sorokin. Um, you know, it's been a rough year for him. Obviously, Game 3 did not go the way that he wanted or anybody wanted there for. But you still got to remember, this guy was a Vesna uh, nominee the year before. He plays Vesna like goaltending year in and year out. This year, obviously, a little rough. But I don't think this is it for Sorokin. I don't think that he's broken Sorokin, which I've been seeing on Twitter. <laughs> I think that he's in the perfect situation going into next season to have this fixed. He has Semyon Varlamov, who's playing great goaltending, has played great goaltending for years in this league, and his head coach is Patrick Law. 
maybe yes, decent point a top three goalie of all time right probably definitely mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but i think that with this camp coming up i think sorokin's going to come back and i think it's more mental like you guys have alluded to mm-hmm. i don't think this is it for sorokin I, f- I feel bad for him i don't think we see him again this playoff either but i think that they're gonna get the sorokin that we know back so jake's official take is hey everybody cool it with the sorokin nonsense he's yes. gonna be all right and I happen to agree. I mean, look, he's obviously had a rough year. We, we've talked about it all season. Unfortunately, it bled into the playoffs as well. Not ideal, but that's why you have an excellent backup in, in Semyon Varlamov. But look, and we've we've said these words in the show before. I mean, there's goalie, goalies that have gone through this sort of thing all throughout the history of the NHL, and, the, and it affects the top goalies, the middle-of-the-road goalies, and, and the bottom-tier goalies too, where, you know, sometimes it just isn't your year, and, and it could be anything. Yep. I mean, it could just be his focus on the game. Maybe there's something going on in his personal life. You just don't know. There's There could be anything and everything going on, but I just... I just think people need to to step off the ledge here with Sorokin and and you know have a little more faith and he's going to bounce back as opposed to oh well he's showing his true colors now <laughs> he's, he's finished you know uh, waste of a contract whatever so I'm with you there Jake I think uh, I think Sorokin is going to be all right I, I think so and I think more than half of the teams in the NHL would kill to have an Ilya Sorokin They're on in your Toronto team. right now they would yeah. love that I that's think... a guy you build a franchise around and th- he's going to show everyone why he's going to be making that 8-5 next year for sure. Well done, Jake. Nice take. Yeah, and like Wa says, it's, that's why you call it a career. I mean, look at mm-hmm. Bobrovsky. Signs that mega deal. Mm-hmm. Everyone's thinking, what on earth is Florida going to do? Cause right. he's not, and then he carries them to a cup. They don't win the cup. Matt Kachuk gets hurt. That plays a huge part of it. Um, you look at, even look at across the, the way, and the, uh, the Rangers there, which is Sturkin. Awful start to this year for him. Mm-hmm. They also had a backup that picked up the slack and... You could look at that and say that Islanders should have gone to Varlamov sooner. Varley did get hurt. Obviously, that played a part. But mm. maybe they let Sorokin rest early in the year, let him recover a little bit, and then he comes back and look at Sturkin what he's doing now. Right. Everyone's got to cool with the trading. First of all, they just they just signed. They're not they're not right. trading him. Um, I've seen rumors for trading them. I've seen. Oh, we should go back to the KHL. And, and you know what's hilarious, too, is the same people that are probably saying trade Sorokin were probably the same people who said, what are you doing sign of Varlamov to that contract, right? Yeah. Probably yeah. the same people. And again, <laughs> that contract, there's a reason why goalies don't get that much money because it's it's a risk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That being said, again, when you have Patrick Wise or coach, someone that's handled adversity mentally, who's learned from his mistakes mentally. I'm not saying that was the best to learn from in heart of using your emotions because he definitely had moments that he probably regrets, Mm -hmm. but at least he knows how to come back from that and still win. And I think Sorokin, who we talked to, said he grew up watching highlights of Sorokin. You asked the question to Rourke about it, and we'll never know. Sorokin will never tell us, but... Yeah, Varley had the advantage because Varley knew how to play under Wah. That that shell shock of having him as a coach already passed. Right. Sorokin, I mean, this is a guy that grew up overseas like Varlama, but never... He was meeting Wah probably for the first time, Mm -hmm. and he knows that Varlama probably has a leg up just because of the the relationship, and he Mm -hmm. wants to be at his best. And when Mm -hmm. you overthink, that's when things unravel yeah it's it could be possible that that stuff came into play we don't know what the bottom line is the guy's a professional he's got to figure it out he's got to yep. he's got to earn that contract and and i have faith that after a summer off and getting back in the training camp he's going to be fine so great take there jake i think it's now time to escape the snake den here <laughs> yes. and talk to you guys about isles fix islanders country get your daily fix of isles news highlights and analysis by describing to isles fix the only monday through friday islanders newsletter sent directly to your inbox sign up for free or become a paid subscriber for added benefits at islesfix.substacks.com. Yes, indeed. And now it's time for Questions Brewing. It's time for Questions Brewing. So go ahead, ask us a question. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> I was not I expecting that, that but yeah. that was fun. Ed, Ed, Jay, how we doing, gentlemen? We're doing good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was at the game last night, and uh, well, the afternoon. It was a matinee game. You know, we didn't even yeah. talk, we didn't even talk about that. Well, I just, well, it's a matinee game, but it ended up being like an evening because yeah, really I was. Right. I wanted and to say later last night it got the Islanders got stronger. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> as the sun grunt yeah, down. The, exactly. Yeah. yeah, but it's it counts because it's when it started. It's so like the, the Islanders, opposite of Superman. He's strengthened by the sun. There you, you know, go. And the book, they're like vampires. They're like vampires. <laughs> once once the sun goes down, they're golden. There you go. Um, yeah, so we uh, we have a lot of questions. Okay. Mainly pertaining to Sorokin. Okay. I think, I think maybe we covered all, some of that respect, already. I think we covered a lot. And okay. Some some questions, maybe uh, unsubstantiated rumors, which I don't think we choose to. Uh, okay. Yeah, give, sure. Give a bit of a platform and officiating, okay. which uh, we can't really. 
We could dive in a little bit. We can dive in a little bit. Yeah, we can dive in a little bit. Yeah, let's talk about the stripes. Uh, even if it's let's a little. Talk, let's talk about the stripes. Just a little on the nose. Let's go for it. A little it. disrespectful. All right, well, Chachi19, you are up. Uh, how much are the refs and lines been getting paid to advance <laughs> Carolina with these bogus <laughs> calls and non-calls? That is definitely one way to put it. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not going to jump into that bandwagon and say that I think the league is is intentionally favoring the Carolina Hurricanes. But, but <laughs> it was hard to tell who the home there, team was yesterday. There, there have been some questionable calls throughout this series, and I think some of it on the part of the Canes doing their best to sell these calls and. I hate that part of the game. I said it before, like earn your earn your calls. I mean, the, the earn your stripes, pun intended. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But no, but as far as the players go, like like I'll be I'll be completely honest with you. If if it was the Islanders doing it, I'd be saying the same damn thing. Like I would be embarrassed to have the Islanders doing that. Like don't don't win your hockey games that way. Like there's there's you know leave that for soccer. You know what I mean? Like they they do it in soccer. I think it's ridiculous over there too. Let them have it. Don't don't let that stuff bleed into hockey. And that's not to say it it hasn't been in the sport, right? And and I think you see it most like when a guy takes a stick to the face, right? They give that little extra, you know, jerk of the neck back to to let the ref know, oh hey, I got somebody hit me in the face, right? But but what we saw in game one with the with the Hurricanes yeah. was just way too much, and and unfortunately, you know, the refs fell for it. And there was even a phantom call yesterday. Where Noah Dobson, it looked like he was going in for a slash. He ends up slashing the ice. He doesn't get the penalty. Right. The refs call it, but I think they ended up getting a little bit of a makeup call later on. There was yeah. one of the calls later on the Canes was a little well, ticky tacky. Uh, so they put the, Barzal in the box for the. Uh, that was the high stick. That was on Dobson. Dobson. That was uh, that was on Dobson. Yeah, but they. That's like the slash though. What are we they looking played at the wrong here? replay at the arena. Uh, he, there was a. I forgot who the puck carrier was for Carolina. Uh, Dobson does slash him on the hands, but it's one of those like. Love tap one. Like, uh -huh. not hard at all. It was like a, a tap of the glove, uh -huh. which I still think that's playoff hockey. You can't call that. Mm. Uh, but, yes, they did play the wrong replay there. But gotcha. to go back, first off, the Hurricanes are doing it because they know how bad the Islanders' PK is. It, they're, they're not – I mean, they're cheating the game in the sense of drawing it, but they know that the Islanders are at their best I, yeah, when they're playing five they're on five. It. Right. So they're going to try to do mm -hmm. it. I thought there were a lot of, you know, the Palmieri slash – not even that there were calls that should have been – no calls at all, but take right. them both. Yes. That's and you saw that with the Barzal, um, Barzal Pesci, where they called Barzal yes. for the hook, but Pesci for holding the stick, I believe. Yes. And Barzal yes. said, like, Barzal's clapping goes, that's great, that's great, because right. that's what the issue is. And yes. I went and saw the Capitals-Rangers game two at MSG, and I've watched mm -hmm. a lot of the playoffs so far. This is not just an issue in this series. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of diving going on. Really? Throughout, that sucks. You, you look I hate at that. Brad Marchand getting slashed in the back of the Achilles and, and looking that he oh, lost God. his leg. Oh, yeah, God, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Jeremy Swayman getting touched, which, again, should have been a penalty on, I believe it was Domi or Bertuzzi, whoever it was. Mm -hmm. Tapped him, but then he does a pirouette spin and falls. You're, right. you're, it's across the board. These players, because they know how valuable power plays are. The problem, And right. I feel bad for the refs because now they're missing calls because they're thinking... Like in that Ranger game, uh, Panarin gets high staked in the face of the blue line. Mm -hmm. Clear penalty, but you're seeing the refs are so nervous to call the dives now that they're putting their whistles away for the penalties that really should be called. Right. So I feel bad for the refs because they're being taken advantage of completely out there. No, it's it's look, it's a tough spot to be yeah. in. And this this game is lightning fast. Yeah. You know, and that's why they that's the reason why they added a second guy eventually, right? There used <laughs> yeah. to just be one ref out there. Yeah. And it's it's still hard enough a job with two of them out there and it, and it's happening so quickly. And so listen, I get it. It's 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 the toughest job in the world. And I, I wouldn't want it. But but I don't I don't think there's been favoritism, but you know, I, I do think it took a little long for the refs to start calling it both ways. Yep. And because like the the dive on the Lee penalty, what was that? Uh, that was Shea. That was a holding. Brady yeah, Shea, I mean he he, he spun the opposite direction. <laughs> like it didn't even make any sense. And and it's the first game in a playoffs. You say, oh god, first this is minute. This, this is the standard they're yeah. gonna set for the playoffs. They're gonna call that, or they're not gonna call it both ways. Like fine, call Lee for the hold, but send the other guy to the box for the embellishment. And they had another another opportunity with Paul Mary later yep. in the game. Sure, call it a slash. He he two handed him. It wasn't you know, severe, but he did two hand him with, you know, with the stick and, and, but then you see, he goes down like a ton of bricks. Like it, it was also delayed too. Like you saw, yeah. he got hit. Wait a second. And oh, I just got so hit all in the, the legs. So it was down. probably Palmieri's stick back on the yeah. follow through, like follow through back. And then you're seeing Slavin go up and you're thinking, oh, he must've hit him. But right. again, this is why we have replay. It takes a second from someone above to say, take both, take one or no call at all. As I drop these cards here. Right. Um, yeah. Just <laughs> ignore that.
Uh, but yeah, so I think the efficient even had a Pelic phantom trip on the guy that cut to the net in game one, mm. where Pel- Pelic stick is there but never contacts. He falls. You saw yesterday with the Engvall gets tripped, which again I didn't think was a trip at all. Mm. But based on how they've called these penalties a series, mm. that's kind of has to be called. Mm. That being said, no one should ever be blaming. I think it's pathetic, and I'm, this is to every <laughs> fan base where you blame refs for losses because bad calls happen in every sport. You have a job to still do. The reason that everyone's complaining so much is that the Islanders can't kill a penalty. If the Islanders' w- penalty kill was killing off more of these power, uh, these penalties, and the Islanders are winning the games, like of course if they win, no one's really going to talk much about it. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, the penalties that were called in favor of the Islanders, and they had the power plays outside of scoring yesterday in the power play, the Islanders weren't coming through, which makes it mm-hmm. worse for the fans. They're saying, "Ah, oh, like we didn't get, we need another right. one. This is pathetic." And the right. Islanders were not killing on their own end, so that's killing them as well. But the Islanders have a job to do. They, they, these guys being left wide open in front. That cannot be happening, especially when you're playing so well five on five. You need the penalty kill to be a spark. You need the guys to come up large. That those easy goals can't happen. Like Nessing can't be left wide open on a glorious play by Carolina, but that's the guy you have to cover. I know you're shorthanded and you're missing a guy, but right, right. that's the guy that can't beat you. The right. guy wide open in front. Yeah, no, you have to have. I mean, you'd rather give a guy, you know, at the top of the circle a chance than the guy right in front of the net. I mean, that's just, you know, PK 101. You got to be covering covering the guys and boxing out the guys in front of the net, and he was there by himself. And even Jarvis, you have three Islanders looking for the puck, and Jarvis is on it. Right. You're there. Right. Um, You just got to make the play. Yeah. So I think, yes, everyone could complain about the refs and how it's been. At the end of the day, the Islanders' PK has a job to do. They haven't done it well enough. If they do it well enough, they might still, they might be up in, the, I mean, who knows what happens in all these games, but it sure. could be a lot different stuff. But yeah, I'll, I'll give you this much, Trottier, the, the the officials, the refereeing has definitely been disappointing yes. at moments, and especially like we talked about yesterday with the uh, very strange icing call. So, so fair enough. What do you got, yeah. Ed? MJ Beckman, uh, what do we read into Clutterbuck only getting seven minutes of time on ice and basically no shift in the third and overtime? I think that's just... You know Patrick Waugh going with the guys who need to be on the ice in those situations. I mean, you you touched this touched on this very well earlier, where you know Patrick Waugh is not going to be shy about making sure the the guys that are given the best chance to win out on the ice. And and it, you know, listen, Clutterbuck, he's he's uh, you know played well, but you know in, in that sort of situation, you talk about foot speed, you talk about uh, you know how how the Carolina Hurricanes are you know swarming on the forecheck and all that and and listen maybe he's he's just a guy who you know at this stage in his career isn't isn't gonna help you as much as maybe he would have a couple of years ago if he's you know if he's out in the ice in those situations so I think it's just it's just Patrick Waugh managing like listen he's gonna want to get he's gonna want to get those top two lines out as much as possible you talked how well the the Pajot line's been playing obviously you want to get Horvat and you want to get Barzell out there as much as possible so that's just him managing his bench and then putting out the guys that are going to give him the best chance to win I was gonna say Waugh wants to win the hockey games yeah and he and I think the reason he's doing this and he's able to do this because he has you know, I don't think anyone in that room hates Wah. I think everyone bought into what he wants to do. Mm-hmm. Clutterbuck is a team guy through and through. Yeah, There's no way Clutterbuck's yeah, yeah. going like this on the bench and right, sitting right, with right. Ishika is Hakov yesterday going, well, F us. Like, whatever. No, they're <laughs> right. rooting for their teammates to win these games. Right. When Clutterbuck's played in big games before, he understands what's happening. He's not. It's not like he thinks he could play and still help this team every shift. Mm-hmm. He understands it. So I don't think anyone should look into it at all. It's the fact that Wah's going to... Play his top three lines, and truthfully, that's that's something that a lot of fans of this team have been calling for for a while anyway. And now they're complaining li- about it, right? Like, no, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not even saying MJ Beckman was no, complaining sure. about. It. He was just yeah. asking, you yeah. know, what do we make of it? And I think this is just a sign of of, of a head coach finally favoring going top heavy with his lineup. Whereas you saw with Barry Trotz, and you even saw a little bit afterwards with Lane Lambert, where you know they like to roll four lines, or at least more than most teams, right? Where you're seeing guys like. Uh, Sezikis, Clutterbuck, and Martin when Sezikis was on the fourth line getting double-digit minutes, right? Maybe 12, 13 minutes a night where, you know, you put them on another squad and and they're probably getting eight, nine minutes, whatever the case may be. So it's finally just, you know, Patrick Wad looking at his team and going a little more traditional in the sense that I'm going to go top-heavy here and put out my top two, maybe three lines, much more heavily in favor of, of the bottom three. Next up from Thomas, pa- Thomas Panic. Who's the new guy wearing number 18? He looks like Engvall, but this guy finished his checks and even joined a scrum or two. Yo, he finished his check. I yes! saw I look yeah. in the press, yes! I'm like, guys, Engvall just laid a hit. And this was a nice one. I think for Engvall, we talk about confidence so much, and what he's gone through this year, too, is is on him. Like, right. Let's, let's mm-hmm. be clear. Mm-hmm. But he, he knows he needs to be better. And he mm-hmm. knows now, I think he's in the right spot. I think playing him as a top winger sparked for a little bit. It mm-hmm. worked out. But then he, he kind of lost himself in what mm-hmm. he is 
role was. And now playing with having a stable line and being able to learn your line mates and also having success plays a huge part in it. But mm -hmm. that line of Lee, Pajot, and Engvall has been great. Engvall could be the guy off the rush. Yep. Lee goes to the net and Pajot is the defensive guy. Right. Engvall knows what his role is and knows that I just need to do this. I think maybe with Nelson and Palmieri at times, he got caught up in, again, he would go south. Right. Try to do these creative, cool, deking plays. He almost got caught yesterday he once, did. too. Yeah. In yeah. the neutral zone, and then he mm -hmm. finally had the puck uh -huh. and went up. But uh -huh. I think he realized, that's not me. Mm -hmm. I'm playing a role right now where I have to skate the puck straight. I don't have to go get it deep. Lee's going to get it deep. I got to support along the boards and get back when I can. Like I think playing on the third line has simplified what he was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. but I think with Nelson Palmieri, whether you tell him, hey, you're, you're straight up the transitioner and, and go win the puck battles... I, I think it's hard to look at those two guys and say, I want to play like them. Right. Maybe you try to do more than what you're capable of and it impacts other areas. So I think confidence is huge, but I think they've kept it simple, even for Lee. Mm -hmm. Lee's diving because his role is a little simpler now. It's sure. the same as it was on the top line, but on the top line, you're playing a lot more minutes. Mm -hmm. It's much more be creative mm -hmm. off the rush. So I think that line is every player on that line is played exactly the way they have to play. Yeah, and it's great to see from Engvall. We're going to wait and see if this is something that lasts longer in his career yeah. here or in his tenure here with the New York Islanders, but he picked a great time to do it. He looks really good in these playoffs, and then hopefully he keeps it up, and hopefully he keeps playing the body a little bit. Yeah. Next up from DTMR, how can you ice the puck 20 times but <laughs> never, clear it down, never clear down the ice in the, uh, in the puck line, on the puck line? I mean... Well, I think it's just... Physics. Um, <laughs> well, well, the problem is, is that they need a breather. Where they ice it a lot because they just know that if they only get it out a little bit, they can't change. And you can't change an icing, but they can catch a breath. Right. They just chip it. The icing right. at least gets you a whistle. Um, but in and theory, it's just because of how aggressive the Hurricanes are. They don't have a choice. It plays to exactly what Sean was talking <laughs> they're, about. They're trying they, to go they up, get overwhelmed down there. And, and I think there's times, too, where they're just trying to go up the boards hard enough to get it into the neutral zone. Mm -hmm. And it's ice. It's going to slide. And if players don't touch it or whatever, and, that's the chance. And with the delay of game rule, you have to be extra careful as well. Yeah. With the way you send it down the ice, right? You can't. You're not going to really want to go off the glass unless you know that you have the room and space to accurately put it off the glass because as as we've seen what was it matt martin took one of those he yeah that holmstrom, though, so right? holmstrom i think this is more on holmstrom or at least that's how martin read it is that holmstrom's mm -hmm. break uh chip out of the zone was a little soft mm -hmm. i don't think they were already pinned for like a minute and a half at that mm -hmm. point right, right, right. i don't think martin thought it was going to get all the way out right so he goes to the it right. might have gone out but yeah. um and then it goes out of out of play but yeah it's just and the reason they were able to survive the icings in this game yesterday compared mm -hmm. to not surviving in game two is the push so they won their face-offs. Right. That they won their face-offs. And difference. whether they made yeah. the break it or not, which they did a lot more mm -hmm. of, they won their face-offs and were able to mm -hmm. at least get the puck out right away and make yeah. changes and things like and that. And I'm, I'm not saying they can't do a better job of the way yeah. they send the puck down the ice. Sure. But but in those split-second decisions where it's either the puck stays here in the zone or it gets out of the ice, you, you don't necessarily have the time to put the puck exactly where mm -hmm. you want it, where it's a chip up high in the air so it lands in the neutral zone or off the glass and into the neutral whatever, and it slows down in time for the goal line. It's just never – it's not always going to be picture perfect, but obviously it, it is a credit to the Carolina Hurricanes because they're putting the Islanders in this position to have to just get the puck out of the, out of the zone by any means necessary. And they've done that to a lot of teams all year, Carolina. This right. is what they do. Right. Next up from Mitch Madness. What moves would you make this offseason, if any, to get this team back to a Stanley Cup final? Generally tough to think of just one or two moves to make. I feel like we still need to table that for the offseason. I feel like we need to wait until, you know, the uh, the playoff, the Islanders playoffs are over before we really dive into it. But I think, you know, without even looking at salary, sure, they could use at least one more top six, win six winger. Um, you wouldn't mind getting a little deeper defensively as well. But, uh, you know, I th <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's pretty much how, how you look at it right, right now. And and then I think once we, we hit summertime, we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into that. Uh, Isle 72, um, do you think the Isles could use a different goalie coach for Sorokin next season? I, again, I think it's all mental. He's in there because there's times where he's in the right spot and he's not making the saves. And I, I think it's all mental. He's also been, it's the same goalie coach that was his goalie coach last year. Pierre right, Greco. Exactly. So... I don't think it's a knock. It's also Varley's playing well. So why are you going to do that to Varley also? Right. Has, I think it's all, not it's all on Sorokin. They need to have, definitely work on different things, especially over the summer with him. Mm -hmm. I, I don't look at the goalie coach as the reason for Sorokin's struggles because it's the same goalie guy that's been here since Sorokin got here. Yeah, and you have Wah. 
I mean, what <laughs> yeah. more of a, what more again, of a leadership Sean, effort Sean do you need? brought it up, and I think I probably brought it up on the show, is the first question I ever asked while when we were on Zoom and they are introducing him was, you know, how are you going to work with the goalies? And he goes, I don't want to really be involved. I trust Piero Greco, their goalie mm-hmm. coach. He's the one that makes the decision on who's starting. Now, obviously, Wa has the final say, but right. down the stretch, I remember asking that question. He goes, oh, it's I let... I the uh, Piero Greco knows the mindset of the goalies each and every day, how they're feeling. Mm-hmm. He comes to me with saying, this is who we should start. I'm not making that decision. Now, I think where Wa can come into play, and he mentioned that on that first uh, Zoom, was that he said, um, I could help with the mental stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be the biggest thing, is this summer... How much is Wa talking to Sorokin? Not maybe not daily, but working on this, working on the mental. Maybe there's exercises that Wa could say, "Hey, watch this," or "Look at this goalie," or just bre- different things. That's where Wa is going to really help him because Wa's not getting on the ice and playing goalie. And like he was saying about Gretzky, is not many people could do what Gretzky did, which is why he wasn't a good coach. Mm-hmm. I think Wa is a great coach, but for goalies, I think it's, it would be the same thing. Mm-hmm. Wa played to such a level that. I don't know if he could talk to other goalies about it because they just, right. you either have it or you don't. Mm-hmm. The same way, with the, the mentality part is, I don't think Walk could ever understand a player not giving 110%, which is why you saw him bench a guy like Engvall once. And you saw different players. I don't think he could grasp that. Mm-hmm. So for Sorokin, it's, we know Sorokin's trying. That's the positive. It's not that sure. it's a lack of effort. I think yeah. Sorokin just needs a mental break. I think if Varley's the starter going forward next season to start the season or it's a split, mm-hmm. I don't think that's a terrible thing. Because you saw this year sure. how much you burned this guy out. Sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, leading into that, uh, do you start Varlamov from here on out in the playoffs? Absolutely. Well, here on out for Absolutely. sure, if Varlamov gets lit up, the season's over. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Like, you're not going to, unless they get to round two, you're not going to really see an opportunity to start Ilya Sorokin because he's he's starting Tuesday. And if he wins Tuesday, he's yeah. starting Thursday. You know what I mean? Sorokin like, had his chance to earn the trust for the playoffs right. and he blew it. So I think it's right. Barley's crease until, I mean, again, if they make it to another series and there's, maybe there's a back-to-back in one of them and you yeah, can't do it. maybe, yeah. Or you're up by a lot or down by a lot in a game and you say, all right, we're just going to give Sorokin some right. minutes. Not right. probably for They don't have a game to burn anymore. So it would have to wait till round two. And obviously, Semyon ends up being the guy who gets you there. So he gets the game one start yeah. and he'd probably have to have a terrible game one just to even think Waz about Sorokin. Was not even and, thinking. Of, at yeah. this point, Was not even thinking about Sorokin. Yeah. It's no point. Nope. Uh, is this Matten? Uh, is this Matten's? Is this Martin and Clutterbuck's last season as Isles? I would say probably Martin. I would not be shocked if Clutterbuck's back as an extra forward on a league minimum or one million. Again, the cap's going up, one million dollar. Or if he is starting next year, but they do the hey, we got young guys from Bridgeport that have earned it. We're gonna mm-hmm. do. You're gonna play every two, every three games. But I think Cal's had it. Cal had an unreal, not like a superstar season, but played in all 82 games. Was physical. Had, I think, the most shots blocked in the last five years for him. He had the most hits he's had in the last five years. Which is the four, I think Clutterbuck could play next year for sure. I am with you 100%. I think this is Martin's last season, and I think Cal Clutter. I would not be surprised if they bring Clutterbuck back on a, on a low-contract, leadership role, maybe extra forward type of situation, yeah. Uh, that is uh, pretty much going to do it. That'll wrap it up. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Good stuff. I don't know what Jay's doing behind me. What's, what's Jay doing do you have over a there? surprise? What do you got going on here? What's going on? I have a surprise. Is that right? A yes. surprise. I'm even on camera with, with my buddy. Oh, let me, oh wow. Let me, let me What's up. happening? Let me well, we're going to need you to speak into the microphone, Jay. I got it. Ed, you're fired. No. <laughs> oh, anyway, hi, guys. Welcome. Hey. Hi, um, I got you guys some gifts. Oh. Is that right? Because, you know, we're at the end of the season. Okay. I don't know how many shows we have regularly left, so... Okay. I got you guys some stuff. I'm crying. Wow, what is it? wow. Some stuff. Some on air surprises. I'm on-air terrified. Surprises. <laughs> what is what is this gonna be? Don't unwrap them yet. Make sure Jay does his camera work. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Still on the job. Yeah, I can, I still work wow. The cameras, Jay, what do we got know? going on here? Okay. Oh, okay. All right. I'll just hold it in my hand. Sure. Okay. That's cool. Thank you. Wow! Even one wow. for the guy in the snake the den. Snake. <laughs> yeah. Look well, at that. I would hope so. Wow. Okay. Okay. Is it a bike? Is it a bike? Okay. Maybe. Let's go, Sean. Oh, okay. Let's let's see what we got here. Oh, wow! Wow! Look at that. Very nice. What do we got? Well, that's my name. <laughs> <laughs> that's me. Look at that. All right, my turn. I wonder what I got. Wow. Love this. Exciting. Beautiful. Awesome. And my name is spelled correctly, Jay. I want to hug you. Very nice. Appreciate wow. that. Very Look nice. That. Look at that. E-F-E. Love the orange. Love We're going snake then. This is outstanding. This is great. Wow. 
<laughs> <laughs> that was. I am shocked. Let's go ahead. I don't know. I'm, I'm scared to see mine now. Wow. Oh wow. Well, it's just. Says I think it's. I think it's better this way. I honestly do. Look at that. That's oh, amazing. That's great. <laughs> Love that. Well, wow, these are gorgeous. This, are, this is awesome. These are wonderful. Thank you so much, oh, Jay. So these are the Yeti cups you were saying were here. Oh, like they're around wow. here somewhere. We're oh, helping you were the environment teasing this. too. Are we? Is that right? Look, well, you're not throwing out. No, well, yeah, I don't care about the turtles. No one actually cares about the turtles. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, but my God. No, like how many turtles? I care are, about the turtles. Turtles are out. great, but I think the percentage of straws going into them is very low. Anyway. Oh, Mel Armenia <laughs> said they Eddie Yeti. I like that. Yeah. Eddie, 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 Eddie. Yeti. There we go. No, I like that. Less, nice. less plastic because you're using a reusable Look at water that. Bottle. Yeah. I never had one of these. Every time I'm I take excited. a sip, I can be reminded of who I am. Yeah. <laughs> it says my name. Yeah. I'm just great. I'm just proud of you, Jay. I appreciate this. Jay, this wow. is great, yeah, man. Jay, Thanks a great. lot. Look at you. Very thoughtful, very nice. We love it. And with that, and with a gift-filled uh ending yeah, here, let's nice. uh wrap this up. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for tuning in here at twitch.tv slash hockey9ny and your favorite streaming providers. I want to send a big thanks to Sean Rourke of NHL.com. Outstanding interview for him. And, of course, a big thanks to our wonderful sponsors, starting with Blue Line Deli and Bagels, located at 719 West Jericho Turnpike in Huntington and 217 Carlton Avenue in East Islip. Check out the menu and order online at bluelinedeli.com. Also, big thanks to Main Street Board Game Cafe, located at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Find out how to unplug your game at mainstboardgamecafe.com. And also a huge thanks to Razor and Kniff, attorneys at law. Nobody likes going to court, but if you have to, call 516-742-7600 for a free consultation. And of course, folks, remember, if you like what we're doing here, rate, review, and subscribe. Let us know how we're doing here at Hockey Night New York. And Stefan, how can we find you on the internet? All right, you can follow me at this <laughs> underscore this nice. on Twitter, nice. Hockey News Islanders and NHL.com. There you go. You can find myself at Shawnee Hockey. You can follow the show at Hockey Night NY on all your favorite social platform places, Twitter, Facebook, all those wonderful stops on the internet. And uh, listen, we're not sure where it goes from here. Obviously, we got to see if the Islanders can win Tuesday, if they can win Thursday, and if they can win Saturday. Either way, we'll be back to wrap the show at, and wrap the season at some point, but we have to wait and see what the Islanders do. So either way, thank you so much for hanging with us here during the playoffs, throughout the season. We're going to see you guys later. So for Stefan, for Jake the Snake, for Ed, for Jay, I've been Sean Cuthbert. We've been Hawking at New York. We'll see you next time. Have a nice drink here. It's going to be great. Yeah.